Hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm David. I'm a partner at Seven Sage. And tonight, I'm so pleased to host Seven Sage consultant Polly Lawson. Polly is a double who, graduating from the University of Virginia with a BA in sociology and later with her JD. After graduating from law school, she practiced at a prominent law firm in DC before moving back to Charlottesville to be a career counselor in the career services office. She spent seven years in career services, quickly promoted to assistant dean for career services. As the assistant dean, Polly was responsible for counseling law students on all aspects of their job search and helping employers recruit students. She has served on different committees of the National Association for Law Placement, NALP, and spoken at multiple NALP conferences. She has conducted thousands of mock interviews, reviewed countless resumes, cover letters, and writing samples, and helped students and alumni successfully navigate the job search process. Polly currently serves as the Assistant Dean for Graduate Studies at UVA Law School. She has met and counseled thousands of prospective students and successfully recruited students from all over the world. She has reviewed thousands of law school applications to the LLM and SJD programs, conducted thousands of admissions interviews, administered a scholarship budget, and negotiated scholarship offers with admitted students. She has spoken at multiple law school admissions council conferences, as well as to the Education USA advisors in the Southern Hemisphere at the Education USA Regional Forum in Buenos Aires. She is passionate about helping law students navigate the law school admissions process to achieve their desired outcome. Polly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It is a real pleasure. So Polly, I am just gonna dive right in. This is the question that I like to ask everybody. I mean, it's interesting to see how the answers vary, but at UVA Law, in as much detail as you're allowed to disclose, how does it work? What actually happens once somebody submits their application um, and it comes onto your computers? You know, who reviews it? Um, mm -hmm. or is there an algorithm that sorts it into different piles? Uh, do you assign different kinds of readers to different files? Uh, who gets the final say? How many people sign off on it? When does the faculty come in? Anything you can tell us, I'm sure we would be interested to hear. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you again for having me. Um, so I do mostly the LLM and SJD admissions, although I used to, to do some of the um, JD admissions um, reading. And so um, the way that it works on the LLM side is once your application is complete, then it goes into a pile. We don't do any sort of pre-sorting. We review every single application um, in its entirety. Um, there's no cutoffs. There's no... Um, there's no pre-sorting or anything like that. Um, and then it goes to a committee of um, administrators and faculty members um, on the graduate committee. And it kind of goes through usually about two readers and then it goes to the chair of the graduate committee who, who makes the ultimate decision. Um, and then um, we communicate that decision with the applicants. On the JD side, it goes to the admission, the JD admissions office and they have their staff and they break it up. Um, again, I don't think there are any cutoffs that they don't review every single file. I mean, every application is read by at least one person. Um, and then they have a process where it goes to two or three members of the admissions committee. And then sometimes they'll get the faculty involved, but usually um, the faculty are less involved in that process. That is good to know. Um, so, you know, when we talk to students in the seventh stage community, I think what people are most curious about is, A, is it possible to get into law school if you're below both medians? And, and B, under what circumstances is that possible? Um, so I don't know how much information you have about that, but let's start with the first one. How possible is it to get in if you're below both an LSAT and a GPA median uh, at a JD program? On the JD side, I'd say it's difficult. It's not impossible, and it certainly has been done before. I mean, they, they do look at each application holistically um, to, to see if there were extenuating circumstances, outside factors. Um, does this person have the potential to succeed in law school is really what they're looking at because 
we have typically about 300 students in the JD program, um, about 1,000 students total in, in each, 300 students in each class, 1,000 students, students total. And so they're really looking to see, is this person going to be successful and contribute to the community here? And if we feel like this could be a strong candidate who is really interested in Virginia and really wants to be here, then I think they're willing to go below, you know, the the numbers. I mean, there's no there's no cutoff or anything like that, but it does make it a little bit more difficult the more you, the farther away you kind of get from the median. So, what sort of thing makes an application really stand out if it's either below the medians or if it's you know below one of the medians? Mm -hmm. If the numbers in some way give give you pause. What's going to make you sit up and take notice and think about going to bat for this application? Absolutely. So I think the, the strongest things that you can have are a very strong personal statement. Um, why do you want to come to law school? Why do you want to come to Virginia? What is it about your story that sets you apart and that's motivating you? And so having that really can show us, one, what a good writer you are, and two, how well you can advocate, and three, um, just that you would be a positive um, country, you would, you would make a positive contribution to the community at the law school. Um, and I think having a strong resume is also important. It doesn't have to be, you know, that you are the leader of every single club or that you are, you know, you have five years of work experience or anything like that. I mean, those are great things if you have them, but it's sort of how you present it to the committee in a way and, and in a way that shows the committee that you're going to be, you know, a, a, um, an active member of the community, you're going to be engaged, you're going to be involved, and, and you're really going to take that seriously and, um, and be a positive contribution. It's interesting to me that you really front loaded why do you want to go to law school and why do you want to go to UVA in your response, because I have, uh, you know, spoken to many other admissions officers, some of whom are at seven stage, some of whom aren't, who, um, it's not that that's not important, but it's it's sometimes not the first thing that they say. So is this a UVA policy? Is this a poly policy? Is this even a policy? Do, do you absolutely need to say why you want to go to law school? Or is it okay to, to write a statement that says something interesting about your life and maybe pivots at the end to a lesson that's going to help you succeed? A hundred percent. Absolutely. And so, first of all, there's no official policy. Um, I'd say that's po it's more of a poly preference than, than anything. Um, you know, um, when I'm looking at these LLM files and, you know, I'm seeing that they're writing specific things about the curriculum at Virginia. And so maybe this is a little bit more LLM focused, but when they're, when they're giving me specific reasons for wanting to be at Virginia, I'm thinking, okay, if they're going to get into NYU, Columbia, Virginia, and Michigan, how can I get them to, to UVA? And so the more that they show me that they're really interested in coming here, the more I feel like, okay, I'm not just making this offer and they're just gonna go on to Columbia. So that might be a little bit more of an LLM specific thing or, or a poly specific thing. Um, I think on the JD side, it is important to have a, a very strong personal statement that can be, um, you know, as, I, as you said, a story where they're talking about um, a lesson that they learned that will that will help them or, or or something about their story that's unique to them. I think there's no right or wrong personal statement, but the the passion and the um, you know the the interests of the author that comes through that differentiates the student that you can't see from the resume that you can't get from the letters of recommendation that you can't see from the transcript. That's what's really important. Does the quality of the writing matter to you? hundred percent. Yes. In a, in a hypothetical world, and obviously this would never happen and decisions don't even work like this, but suppose that you get to admit only one more student. There's only room for a single other person. Mm -hmm. And um, these identical twins apply and they have identical numbers and they also have identical background, whatever. The only thing that's different is that for whatever reason, one of them is a spectacular writer and the other one, um, I guess they don't have identical uh, backgrounds because one of them has done a, a ton more, you know, relevant law stuff and uh, just writes a much more plotting statement, uh, maybe even a clumsy statement, but it really establishes a solid motivation for why they want to go to law school and you believe it. Which one of those two do you admit? That's a great question. I might have to 
cheat and say I would admit both of them. Oh, um, it's cheating. <laughs> no, uh, I, I mean, obviously, a well-written statement is extremely important. And especially if there's something else that, you know, if, the, if that's making up for something or if that's showing the committee like, okay, you know, like, maybe the, the numbers aren't the greatest, but look, this person can really write. This person has a, has a really passionate, you know, a really interesting story to tell. That really can help push that candidate over the edge. I think the, the experience and, you know, if they're the same candidates, but one's just kind of a meh personal statement, um, if there are fewer spots in the class, it might, maybe that person's waitlisted or, and maybe doesn't get in right away, but ultimately hopefully gets in. Um, it, it, it's hard to say, but I think um, I think I would probably um, go with the better personal statement. Interesting, better personal statement over better story or better experience, because it seems like you're conflating quality of the writing with the quality of the story. And I guess the distinction mm -hmm. I'm trying to make is some people have no story to tell. Some people are going to write a personal statement about doing the Rubik's cube or um, a sign that they saw in the library, but they're an incredible writer. So not much story, but amazing with words. And other people are gonna have an incredible story to tell, but they're not much of a writer. Um, if, if that's the distinction, you know, wh which one of those candidates would you admit or is it both? I think it's still both because I think, I think one of the things that we try to do in, at, you know, at the law school, obviously we wanna have students who are going to succeed in the classroom and that does have you know some aspect of being a good writer but we also teach you in law school how to write like a lawyer and how to think like a lawyer so it's not pre presumed that you actually you know you absolutely have to have that coming in okay i want to tack back to something else interesting you said so you're mentioning that the um, interest in uva is a very important component to you because you don't want to lose people to columbia or whatever what makes a YX statement good? I mean, you know that presumably a lot of applicants are looking stuff up on your website and choosing some things and then and then saying them back to you. So how do you mm -hmm. suss out what, you know, how do you suss out the real interest? That's a great question. Um, on the LLM side, I would say that it's probably, I mean, even just doing that and taking that extra step kind of shows me that you really are, you know, you've, you've gone a little bit farther and you've, you know, you've seen that the law and business program, you know, has these different courses or that these different professors are teaching um, M&A or corporations for law and business and you're really interested in that program and, and you've done a little bit of research about it. It is a little bit kind of just recycling the website back to us to some degree. So, um, and that's why I think it's just a poly specific thing, because for me, I think that if you're going to do that much more research to show that you're interested in Virginia, um, then that shows me that you really are, you know, you, you are interested. I mean, obviously your application shows that you're interested as well, but it just, it goes a little bit farther. And I think maybe it just puts you up a little bit higher in, in my mind. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is if you submit an essay to me that says, you know, and that's why I really want to study at Georgetown Law. Well, that's that's great, but how often Georgetown. does that happen? Um, it happens more often than you would think, actually. Um, <laughs> it's it, it happens at least probably five times a year, if not more. Is it is it an automatic, immediate no? Not necessarily. Um, it depends. A, a lot of it depends on some of the faculty members who are reading the application and the other aspects of their application and how strong that is. Um, for me, it's a, we can give this offer, but they're probably not going to come to Virginia. Um, mm. So it's sort of a wasted offer, but sometimes the faculty like to make those offers anyway. So if somebody does make a mistake, um, should they send a correction? And is there any mistake that's minor enough that they should not send a correction? You know, a, a missing comma in, uh, in a sentence, for example, it, would that warrant a new personal statement emailed to your office? I think something as minor as like a missing comma or, or a, you know, a punctuation. 
um, would not warrant a correction sent to our office. Something that is more substantial, and we have students do this every year. They always, you know, they may say, oh, I, I noticed a typo in my personal statement and I'd like to submit it with this one. And so we'll take that and, and we'll add it to their application file. I typically read both of them. I don't necessarily read them with a fine tooth comb to see if I can figure out what the typo is, but we, we try to just, just to make sure that they're not drastically different, right? So it's not like it was written in this way and then it's been edited four times and now it's been rewritten but it's like if they're you know if they're essentially the same then that's okay i but i, I wouldn't worry about a comma or you know something really minor um something where and and we have students who update their resume if they pass the chinese bar exam or if they um something has happened significantly and their resume has changed we they often will update their resumes with that information and that's perfectly acceptable if someone sends you a new essay to correct something, are you happy to take it or does it make you a little grumpy and less inclined to read favorably? Um, you know, to me, it doesn't make me all that more, much more grumpier, to be honest. Um, you know, I've made mistakes. I've hit send before I'm supposed to. And so I understand that it happens. Um, lawyers make mistakes. I think, you know, if you recognize it, acknowledge it, fix it and move on, then it, to me, that's the best thing you can do. Okay. Good to know. How do you feel about extra essays that are not on the application? Um, so for example, on the JD side, um, a YUVA standalone statement, um, that, that's not, you know, UVA doesn't say, if you'd like to submit this, you can but some people do it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think they can be helpful. Um, I think they can also potentially be harmful. So I think you just have to be very careful when using them. Obviously you don't wanna cause the admissions committees to have to read you know, two extra essays um, that they're not looking for. So I would you know, look at the instructions of each application to see if, if it's allowed, if it's, you know, strictly forbidden you know obviously you don't want to violate the specific instructions of each school but um if they're done right and they're done well they can be really helpful to the committee to just give you a to give them a little bit more um information about the about you and and the applicant and um you know why it is you're interested in uva and i think sometimes you can do that informally too so whether that's on a school visit or you know, if that's going to an LSAC forum, or if that's, um, you know, maybe just on a more informal basis, you can kind of put a face behind the paper. I think that can be helpful. If a student is visiting, should they try to get a meeting with you? What's the best thing they can do? Well, for the JD students, we have, um, we have student tour guides who lead tours every day during the week, um, during the school year when classes are in session. Um, and so, and then there are certain classes that students can visit. So we encourage, and that's all published on the website, um, and it's no secret when that is, and, and students are welcome to and encouraged to, to come and visit. I think it really helps give prospective students a sense of what the community is like, and um, obviously what the facilities are like, but, but really, you know, sitting in on the class kind of lets you, can you see, can you see yourself there? Um, and then if you wanted to meet with one of the admissions officers, you're, you're welcome to do that. What I would suggest is emailing in advance. Um, if you're coming from the LLM side, chances are you might be coming from a different country. And so um, giving us enough advance notice that we can um, put, to, so the LLM side is a little bit more tailored to LLM specifically. So we'll put together a group of students to show you around, to take you to lunch, to kind of, um, if there's a class that you want to sit in on, on the JD side, because we, we do have so many more visitors, um, it's a little more routinized. routinized. Um, but if you want to, in addition to do the tour and sit in on the class, and on Fridays they have a student life Q&A panel, um, if you wanted to meet with um, Ashley or, um, or Dean Falk, then I would just email ahead of time and make sure they're going to be in the office, because they too travel a lot. and so. Um, you know, the, the schedules might not work out, but if you give them enough notice, then um, it, it, would, it would be good. Um, on the LLM side, I imagine that you get many applicants who speak English as a second language. Um, and 
you you don't get to read LSAT writing. Um, so how do you try to, you know, I, I mean, if you can read LSAT writing, I assume you can sort of triangulate and say, okay, you know, I think that this is what the writing looks like when they're not prepared. This is what the writing looks like when they have all the time in the world. You know, I, I buy it. Without LSAT writing, how do you tell if the writing is genuine, if it's doctored, um, if you believe it? <laughs> That's a great question. And that is one of the challenges. Um, I think if, well, one thing we try to do is we try to do interviews of students. And so just to get a, I mean, we look at their TOEFL score, score or their IELTS score. And so if their writing is significantly off from what they submit with their application or if there's a big disconnect, that's a red flag. Um, but for the most part, or if the writing is too good, right? Like and there are no, grammatical mistakes or, you know, prepositions where there aren't supposed to be, um, then sometimes, you know, that will, will, will notice that. So it's hard because we don't have the LSAT writing, but we do have, I've, I think I've, I've written, read enough personal statements to, to have read the ones that are overly produced, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I have read personal statements where the personal statement reads exactly like the red letters of recommendation. So that's a big red flag to me as well. I know in some cultures, it's, it's common for the recommender to say, send me a draft of your recommendation letter. And so they just sort of cut and paste from their personal statement and, you know, maybe make a couple changes. But um, that's definitely a big red flag. That's interesting, because I feel like our culture is one of those cultures where it's common. I, I, I've heard of it more and more often, recommenders asking the student to write the recommendation first. Um, in fact, I first encountered it when I was a student. Uh, it wasn't, for, wasn't when I was applying for a JD program, but a professor at my writing program was famous for having people write their own recommendations. Um, and I, I think it puts the student in a hard position because if they have a relationship with the professor, you know, they may not have very many professors mm -hmm. who, um, whom they feel close to and, and for whose class they did well in. And so, you know, if you only have two or three of those professors or one, which is totally understandable, and the professor says, can you write the letter? What are you supposed to do? That's a, a good question. I mean, and I think that's a fair point. I think that you have to maybe just provide a couple of highlights that you, I mean, I guess, I guess you could say I'm not comfortable writing the letter, but I'm happy to give you a copy of my resume and my personal statement and, you know, some things that I think I've done well, um, you know, and if he or she is okay with that, then proceed that way. But, but it can be challenging. And I understand that it can put an applicant in a difficult situation. I just wanted to make the point that, you know, if the, if the personal statement is written this way and both of the letters of recommendation are written, you know, with the same phrases and the same um, kind of languages, it's like, well, does this professor even know who this person is mm -hmm. or this partner or, you know, whatever, because it sounds like the person just wrote it and, you know, they're, they've written their personal statement and here they are. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, what do you do when you come across a personal statement that feels overproduced? Is it an automatic no? Is it cause for more investigation? Is it just sort of a cloud that hangs over it? It's, I would say it's between a cause for more investigation and a cloud that hangs over it. It just kind of depends on where we are in the cycle and what the numbers are looking like. And I mean, I wouldn't say it's an autom it's not an automatic no, but it's, it's definitely a, let's look into this a little bit because this seems sort of off. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, just a couple questions about undergraduate work, and then mm -hmm. I think I'm going to open it up to everybody. My first question is, to what extent, especially for the JD program, does your undergraduate major matter? Honestly, um, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, I think what's more important are, you know, your grades, how, how much your... It, it matters if, for example, you studied, um, you know, science or a STEM background and you want to pursue IP and that's a, you know, that's a clear story and that's an obvious um, next step. But 
it, and it, if you studied science and you want to pursue law because you have absolutely no interest in IP, that's fine too. Um, but I think in some senses, it just, it makes sense where it's a natural path and in others, you know, you could be a history major. I was a sociology major. Um, it, uh, some of my colleagues were accountants and math majors. So it, it's, it's very, um, it's very diverse. It's just um, what, it, what interests you about law and why do you think you want to go to law school and be a lawyer? Do you care what activities people do in their undergraduate career? And do you care if they have anything that shows um, a legal interest? So I would say you don't need to join, you know, the pre-law society just to be in the pre-law society if that's not where your interest is. I mean, some people don't know they want to go to law school until they're in law school or, um, you know, I would say what's more important is that if you are passionate about something and you're involved in something extracurricularly, ex in an extracurricular way, um, and you've taken a leadership position with that, I think those are the more important types of involvement and student involvement. You don't want to be just involved for being involved, um, but you do, um, if you have shown leadership, if you have had um, big events that you've done, it doesn't matter substantively what they are, whether they're, you know, political or not political, whatever they are. It's as long as they're important to you and they're what really drives you. That makes sense. Okay, at this point, I'm going to open it up to our guests. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, we'd like to hear from you. We can also take questions from the chat window. You can also uh, type questions into the Q&A module, but it's, it's better for us if we get to speak with you. So don't be shy. And uh, Sam, I'm going to call on you. And you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, um, thanks for, for doing this today, first of all. Um, can you guys hear me? We can, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I just had a kind of specific question. Um, I got my letters of recommendation a couple months back, and uh, I, I had planned to apply this cycle, but I decided to forego until next cycle. Um, would this be an issue? you think I should uh, maybe have my recommenders um, – uh, uh, change the dates on these or, 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 you know, or should ask them for new letters. Um, what do you guys, or what do you, would you recommend? What do you think, Polly? So my, my advice would be one, it depends on the nature of the relationship. So if this is somebody who you worked with in college and, um, you know, as an academic recommendation that nothing has changed since you've written that paper or you, you know, gave that, mm -hmm. um, then, then it's okay to leave it as it is um, and to submit it. Um, if it is a professional recommendation where, you know, the nature of your work or your involvement has changed or will change, then it's probably better to get an updated recommendation um, from your supervisor or from whomever at your organization. Okay. Because I think, yeah. I think, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think if enough time has gone by, it does look a little funny that, you know, this is from November of 2017 instead of November of 2018, um, or 19, as it were. But um, yeah. um, if it's an academic re recommendation and nothing has changed, I don't think that the, the nature of the letter is going to change whether you've, you know, you've got another year of experience or not. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I got two, two um, academic and one. Uh, like mentored through school, so that I don't think maybe maybe help change and ask for a new one on that one, but the others, um, not necessarily because they're just academics. But thank you, appreciate yeah, it. You're, you're welcome, absolutely. Good luck, Sam. Thank you. Okay, Cindy, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Polly. Thank you for Hi. your advice. They're very useful. And I'm an international student, and I want to ask when you're considering granting uh, scholarships to an international student, what, uh, what's your preference? Like, what kind of students would you really like to have? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for the, the LLM program, um, 
we do kind of a combination of need and merit based for the JD program. It's mostly merit based as I understand it. Um, and I don't think they just necessarily distinguish between international students and um, domestic students. So if your, you know, your LSAT and your GPA are strong and your work experience and your whole application is very strong, then they will award scholarships based on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good luck, Cindy. Yes, good luck. Okay, Lewis. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, it's going okay. Um, uh, so uh, my background, uh, I did a, uh, you actually talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, so I am interested in going into IP law. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did my uh, undergraduate in biology and I have a GPA around like a 3.0. And I did my uh, PhD in, uh, in biology as well. And uh, I had a much higher GPA from that. And I was wondering uh, to what extent each of these GPAs would be looked at in my application and whether I should emphasize sort of my, my background in biology uh, and that, if, if that would give me an advantage. I certainly, I think so. I mean, I think you might want to highlight the upward progression and trend in your mm -hmm. GPA. Right. Um, obviously, they're, they're looking at both and they'll see both. But I think your um, how that relates to your interest in IP and in your interest in pursuing a career in law, um, I think would be helpful for them to know. Okay, that's a uh, great advice. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. All right, Paul, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. We're having, we can't hear you, Paul. So we might come back to you. We'll just leave it open and see if, we'll see if it ends up working. In the meantime, Kayla, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. You have to click unmute, Kayla. Are you there? All right, we're going to try it one more time. Third time is the charm. <laughs> Maria, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we sure can. Hi. OK, hi, um, it's Polly and David. Um, so my question is in regards to the last question that we were talking that David asked about um, extracurriculum activities. I realize that most schools always ask, like, a question like what have you taken part in um, extracurriculum activities where have you like volunteered and different things in reality um, in my situation um, you know when life is happening you're a full-time student you're a full-time parent and you still have a full-time job I during my complete undergraduate I didn't have time to you know volunteer here or there or you know, join clubs, but at my job where I spend a lot of my time, um, I do have like major responsibilities, like leadership, um, a bunch of a bunch of those stuff. Does it hold the same value as an extracurriculum activity? A hundred percent, yes. And I would say that what you've done is probably more impressive than than what um, someone who, and, and I guess I should preface what, what I said or, or make the caveat that I was sort of thinking about students who are coming straight from undergrad to law school. And, um, you know, if you're working full time and raising a family and um, you do have significant responsibilities with your job, I think that is extremely important. And I think that will reflect very well on your application. Thank you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hey. Good luck, Maria. Good luck. Thanks, David. Paul, has your microphone situation improved? Hi, yes. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Hi, yes. Uh, my question more relates to, I guess, reapplicants. Mm -hmm. um, as far as reapplying for a school that you didn't get into in the previous cycle, resubmitting certain application materials like um, character and fitness for like a, a speed an old speeding ticket or um, more more uh, 
likely um, a person rewriting a personal statement should in terms of uh, the emissions committee re -look looking at old application materials should we treat the new personal statement as a continuation or an update of the old one or should we write an entirely new one that covers basically the, the, the previous 12 months so my advice would probably, I mean, first of all, you need to look at the schools because some schools will specify, you know, if you're reapplying, you, you need to write a brand new statement. You, we don't want to see the same thing. Um, but I think writing something new could be helpful because you, you don't want it to be reciting your resume and what you've been doing for the last 12 months. But if you can think about stories or, or, or ways that you've grown in the year or, or I don't know, whatever you've done, um, that that really shines a new light on your application and makes a stronger application. I think that's what you want to do. David, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a question that we get often. And of course, as you said, the first step is always to read the instructions because different people have different instructions. Um, the second step is to reread your essay in, you know, the sober morning light of um, couple months later and just try to figure out if you can make it better, if it still reflects um, why you want to go to law school and what's special about you, if it still seems like a good story, um, if it still feels authentic. And if you can't make it better, this is a moot point, right? Because you should just make it better and it's going to be different and uh, you'll have improved it anyway. If, on the other hand, you wrote something that still feels like your lifeblood is there on the page, um, you know, one strategy is to just try to change the first paragraph and or the last paragraph. Um, so you give it a new dust jacket, so to speak, and an admissions officer reading it can tell at a glance that it's different, but maybe the heart of the story stays the same. Hope that helps, Paul. Uh, that does very much. So thank you. Okay, good luck. Good luck. Um, Salvador, you can ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, so I had a quick question about like my resume. Um, so these past four years, I did debate in high school. So these past four years have just been teaching debate at summer camps. And that's one, been one of my passions and what I've dedicated myself to. And I haven't done like many internships. I haven't done any internships actually. And that's what I usually spend my summers on because I really like debate. Does that hurt me in any way? Or should I try looking for an internship before I apply to law school to kind of like diversify? I think if debate is what you're passionate about and that's what you're doing and now you're using it to teach others, I think that can be, I don't think you need to necessarily look for something just to, you know, check a box on your resume. I think that that um, makes a lot of sense. It tells a story and it's who you are. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. That's, it's, it's always nice to get a very good definite answer. No, yeah. you don't need to do that. Good luck, Salvador. Good luck. Uh, Moshe, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Sure. Um, my question is regarding uh, rolling admissions. Um, I have a, uh, an LSAT score that I'm, that I'm happy with, but I think I have another LSAT score coming out uh, in about a week and a half. Um, is there any advantage of submitting my applications now? Um, and like, does that like get me ahead of, of the line of the people who are waiting for their November scores in a week and a half, or uh, I should just wait and submit it in a week and a half? What do you think, Polly? Does he get to cut in line? Um, I'm not sure that it will make all that much difference. I think also sometimes schools will wait to see that score anyway, um, especially you know if you if you want them to or if you've asked them to or if they know that you're taking that that exam or if you've taken. Um, but I, I do think there's a little bit of value in go ahead and applying. Um, David, what do you, what's your what are your thoughts? Um, of course. It depends on what your current score is. I, I usually tell people that um, if you are probably not going to get rejected immediately based on your current score, 
And if you are sure that you're going to apply this cycle, no matter what your new score is going to be. So there's no chance you'll see the score and say, I'm not going to apply at all. Right. And if you're finished with your application, you can't make it any better um, by waiting, then I would say apply. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good advice. I hope that helps. All right. Good luck. Good luck. Admin three. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. So uh, my question is, um, I'm prior service and I've been out for a little while. I've uh, been out of school for even longer. Uh, what are some things that I can do to, um, I guess, leverage, leverage that? Or is it, is it possible to stand out uh, give, given those circumstances and uh, two, what, what if my, my GPA during school wasn't as high, but I get maybe 50 percentile for the LSAT? That's a great question. So first of all, thank you for your service. Um, I, I think that um, that definitely can be an advantage. I think you want to highlight your, your experience. I think people, students, applicants who you know, maybe went to law school or went to undergrad and then spent some time in the service. And then, you know, that really matures you and, and grows you. And, be, you know, you become a very, um, we like, we, we love having those students in our classes. And so um, just the experience that you've had. So I think that um, you want to highlight that in your application. You know, maybe it's an experience that you had in your personal statement. Obviously, it'll be on your resume as well. Um, but I think that that's, that can certainly be a strength for sure. And Polly, how, how can you highlight it? Does it mean writing a personal statement about it? Um, is there some other way to highlight it? You can include part, I mean, I guess it depends on what the rest of what you had planned for your personal statement, but it, you know, it can be in your personal statement. Um, you can, I wouldn't spend, you maybe don't want to spend your entire personal statement, but you could certainly spend part of your personal statement as to, to, as it's part of your story um, and have that included. Um, you could, um, if it's a, if it's an addendum where you're, you know, you're talking about your grades in undergrad, but you know, you've, you've really matured a lot since then, that could be an avenue as well. That makes sense. Um, okay. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. You're welcome. Good luck. All right. Timon, you can ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for doing this. Um, and props to you for pronouncing my name correctly. Not a lot of people can. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, do you get Timon? Yeah, yeah, Timon? just everything. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my question was on, so I see UVA has like a X by decision and I'm looking at a couple places um, debating early decision. I was wondering if those applications were read any differently. I know that, you know, when you read them, you have, you know, basically 100% yield of if you accept this person, they are coming here. Um, so I had a question just kind of if you could address that. Sure. So I think the I think the biggest difference is you'll get a response within I think it's two weeks. Um, so they're read very quickly and um, they're determined very quickly. Um, it shows the committee that you're serious, obviously, about UVA because you're coming if if you're admitted. Um, the other thing that can happen is you can get deferred, you know, to the regular cycle, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, but. Um, I think it shows your seriousness of purpose and your um, intent and your interest in the school. All right, cool. Thank you very much. All right, good luck. Bye. Um, Brandy, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I just wanted to ask two questions. Um, one being, what would you characterize as the strongest aspects of your school? And the other question being, what criteria are used to award merit-based or need-based scholarships? Okay, great. 
Um, I think the strongest aspects of the experience of Virginia, and obviously I went to law school a million years ago, but um, is really the, the quality of the experience. I mean, it's one of the best law schools in the country, but it's students are very collegial. The students are very, obviously very smart and very high achieving, but they're, they're not interested in getting ahead at somebody else's expense. They're always looking back behind them to see who they can help. Um, they're, you know, if somebody misses class, they're going to email them with the notes. Um, it, it's just a very supportive environment. I think that's true of the faculty, the staff, and the students. Um, and I think that, that, that that's what sets Virginia apart a little bit from our peers. It's obviously in Charlottesville is a smaller city, but it's close to DC. It's close to, um, you know, the direct flights to New York, Chicago, Philadelphia. It's, it's just, it's a great city. It's a great place to be. Um, w with respect to the um, aspects for merit-based aid, I think it's, I mean, it's everything in your application. It's, um, you know, your LSAT scores, your GPA, your, you know, how likely are you coming to Virginia? Um, those kinds of things are, are what they make the decisions on for merit-based aid. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, good luck, Brandy. Polly, does, do you think applying earlier ever affects how much um, financial aid you're offered? That's a great question. Um, I think applying earlier can help your admissions outcome, um, ultimately, assuming everything else is equal. With respect to scholarships, they do the scholarships a little bit later in the process, so I'm not sure that it really it, it necessarily correlates with when you applied and how much aid you get. In your experience, is, 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 is it ever too late to apply? I mean, obviously, it's too late to apply after your deadline. But is there a time before that deadline when your odds really drop precipitously? I haven't looked at the data on, on that on the JD side. Um, on the LLM side, as long as you apply by the deadline, your application will be reviewed. If you apply after the deadline, your application will also be reviewed. It just might take longer um, to, for you to get a response. Um, so I don't, I don't know um, that there is a specific date. I mean, I do think the later you get into the process, the less likely it can be once, you know, because we do have a relatively small class. And so I think they're very careful on the JD side with the number of offers that they make. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm going to take Kayla's question. Well, Kayla, we'll try one more time to unmute you to see if you can make your microphone oh, work. Is it, is it working right now? Oh, it's working now. You can ask. Oh, perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for doing this for your time. And um, I'm an international JD applicant. And I just noticed that um, there's relatively fewer international JD students uh, compared to domestic students. So I just wanted to ask uh, your recommendations on how international students can improve their chances. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Well, um, honestly, I, I think that just putting the best application possible forward that you can. So your letters of recommendation, Seven Sage has a great resource on applying mm -hmm. as an international student. Um, and um, I think that's definitely worth taking a look at. But I, I think really, you know, getting a strong resume, personal statement, getting all of that to be the best that you can um, and putting that forward is what's gonna help propel you. Thanks so much. Yes, David, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying, Polly, is there's no fairy dust you can sprinkle on the application. You sort of have to do what everyone else has to do. This is an interesting question to me because we have seen in the data that international students tend to fare worse than domestic students with similar LSAT scores. That data doesn't actually distinguish between students with, a, uh, with an LSAT reportable GPA and students who got the ACRAO evaluation of superior or above average, et cetera. Um, so so uh, we're not quite sure what accounts for that. We're not even sure if this correlation is causal. Um, it may be that being international causes you to do worse. It may not be. It may be that there's something else that's going on with international students. For example, um, perhaps because more international students speak English as a second language, um, 
more international students are are writing essays that you know are not as strong um, as domestic applicants with similar LSAT scores. Um, you know, given my suspicion is it probably has something to do with concerns about English or um, or the writing, and and so this actually dovetails with our earlier discussion. I, I think it means that you have to write the the best possible essays and. Of course you do. You 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 also have to write the best possible essay if you're a domestic student. Um, it may mean that you should practice for LSAT writing more than a domestic student if you're a JD applicant, because we also talked about the fact that it's more likely, I think, that an admissions officer is going to compare LSAT writing with your personal statement. Is that right, Polly? Am I off base there? I think no. I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. So so maybe prepare more for the writing portion of the test. Think more about your essays. Um, and, and just work harder on them. I, I really believe, and again, I'm going to see if Polly agrees with me, but I, I believe that it's okay if your English isn't, you know, absolutely perfect. If, if you have some, um, non idiomatic terms, turns of phrase, I, I think what matters is that you show that you can think, um, and you don't necessarily need to be a poet to demonstrate that you have strong analytical capabilities. Is, is that true, Polly? That's, a, yes, that's, that's very true, 100%. Um, so in a nutshell, work on the writing more. Great advice. Does that help, Kayla? Yeah, thank you so much. All right, good luck. Good luck. Hope it works out. Hi, Farsh. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Okay, I'm gonna leave you unmuted and see if um, something happens. Um, but we have a great question that, that Ryan typed. Polly, is there a difference between how law schools evaluate mature students, for example, or i.e. those that have already gotten a graduate degree or have work experience and how they evaluate students who are applying right out of college? So honestly, I think it depends a little bit on the school. Um, on the LLM side, there are some schools that require work experience and other schools that don't. On the JD side, that may be this, the same answer as well. Um, I do think that having some work experience can be a benefit. And so I think you can spin that in your application as a positive thing. That's not to say that coming straight through from undergrad is, is not a good thing because obviously we have both and and we welcome both and and I think the diversity of the class is um, predicated on having you know students who have come straight through and students who have significant work experience so I think that if you can highlight that in your application and talk about sort of how it's led you to law school and show how it's led you to law school I should say um, then that's going to be the most effective and that's going to be the best way to package it I think um, there is you always want to kind of have your theme of what your you know two or three sentence one sentence story of your application is and so to the extent that just further supports that that's what you want um polly i have a follow-up question okay. we asked if it matters what your major was and you said really it doesn't matter that much um if you have work experience does it matter what kind of work experience you have I think as long as you're telling a consistent story, as long as it doesn't matter. I mean, I've seen applications and students who have gone and done all sorts of different things, Teach for America, or, um, you know, they've worked for, they've done an internship in law firms, they've been paralegals, they've done um, to starting their own businesses, to, you know, all sorts of different things. And um, so I don't think it really matters necessarily what the experience is, as long as it's su supporting your reasoning for wanting to come to law school and kind of telling a complete cohesive story. So they don't necessarily need to get a job as a paralegal? No, not necessarily. Okay, but what if somebody graduated and they know they want to apply to law school in two years and they want to do a job now and they don't care too much about what they do, what, what advice would you give that person if they're looking for work? I mean, Should they I, look for a job in the legal field or? or not? 
I think it will tell them a lot about what they what they want to do. So I'll give you an example of my, from myself. So my own experience. So I worked um, as a paralegal at an insurance defense firm um, two years after I graduated from college for about a year. And from that, I realized I loved the research and the writing, but I knew I never wanted to step foot in a courtroom. Um, and so it wasn't until later, the, the following year, that I was working for Cox Communications in Atlanta in their regulatory technology practice group where there was this whole other side of law and in, in regulatory work that in telecommunications um, that my boss was a lawyer and he went around the country and negotiated these agreements. And I thought, wow, I could actually really do this because it's not setting foot in court and it's it's not. so those two experiences kind of led me to law school and um, was, was really what I wanted to do. So while one was at a law firm, I think the essentially the only advantage I got was I was more familiar with the terms that we, re, we used in civil procedure because I had written them and um, read them um, so frequently. But honestly, it was really just the experience of the different types of things you can do when you're practicing law that really said, okay, this makes sense. This is a good decision for you. So I don't think you have, I mean, I think if you, if you want to work in a law firm, I have students who um, are, you know, worked for two years in a law firm and then as a paralegal and then, you know, took some time off and did something else and now are applying to law school. That's great because they've, they've done the paralegal work and they know what is expected of them as associates. And so I think they can tell a coherent story, but I don't think you have to necessarily work in a law firm to to get that but it can be helpful if if you if you do that is helpful farsh have you figured out your microphone situation yet okay i'm just going to read the question then farsh also typed it okay um where in my application should i put information that is personalized to my interest in the school if it doesn't fit well into my personal statement and by information that is personalized to my interest in the school, I, I think Farsh means what we often call like a YX part mm -hmm. of your essay uh, or, or just part of your application. Where do you, where do you show, if you can't put it in your personal statement, where do you show that you love UVA or how do you show that? I think you could write a, an addendum for a Y UVA or whatever school. Um, and you could say, you know, these are the areas that I'm interested in, and this is why I want to come to UVA specifically. Um, it doesn't have to be another personal statement. Um, you know, it can just be a quick paragraph, um, but do it as an addendum and just let us know, like, this is, this is what I'm thinking about. I often recommend that people um, try to default to putting something at the end of your personal statement, because I think that puts less pressure on it. I, I feel like if you're asking an admissions officer to read an extra unsolicited essay, you've got to make sure that it's worth their time. Um, is, is that true, Polly? That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you, yes, I think that's true. Um, and I, I also find that the vast majority of people who are writing YX essays understandably don't actually have that much to say, you know, they look it up and they say, oh, it looks good. Um, and you know, if, if, if that's the case, then it may be that you can just distill the very best things you have to say at the end of your personal statement, um, instead of writing an essay that, that might end up having more filler. Um, mm -hmm. now if you can write a whole essay that has no filler and you have super genuine reasons, that's great. You should do it. Um, but a lot of the times the people who have the easiest time filling out a whole extra essay, which does, it doesn't have to be that long. I mean, it could be half a page, I suppose. But the people who, who end up writing the most compelling YX essays are often people who have some personal connection to the school. They went there for undergrad, or they live near the place, or they have a relative who goes there, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Uh, let Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read one last question, and I think we're out of time after that. Um, Lewis asks, "I've read opinions online that state that having a doctorate in STEM means that the ranking of the law school one attends is not as impactful." I was wondering how much truth there was to these opinions. Uh, 
Lewis, I am actually going to call on you because I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, so if you're there, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello? Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm not sure what your question means. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I added an, uh, underneath it that uh, I mean this specifically in the case of those who are looking to go into IP law firms afterwards as to whether how much the firms put onto the ranking of the school that you went to. Uh, so we have a question for Polly and her capacity as career counselor here. Yes, please. <laughs> so Polly, let me just ask the question one more time just to make sure that okay. everyone understands it. If you have a PhD in science, does it matter where you went to law school? And does it matter as much as it would if you didn't have a PhD? I would say it probably doesn't matter as much as if you didn't have a PhD. I think having the PhD and having that background is very attractive to law firms um, in, in different fields and different, um, but I think especially in STEM, you know, having that is an extra credential that the JD students don't have. So they might be willing to, I guess the question is, does the career services office at that school have a strong connection with IP um, or, or a strong program or reputation in IP that could put you in front of those employers um, and and put you in front of, like, or alumni, or um, do they have the networking to, to support you if that's what you wanna do? I see, so it's a matter of sort of having specific connections between that school and different firms. Yes. Okay, oh, that's uh, fantastic advice. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you everybody who attended, and Polly, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and insight with us. I am so happy that you're on the team and I can't wait to do this again at some point. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm excited to, to work with everybody and um, thank you so much for your time. All right, everyone, I'll see you on the forum. Thanks a lot.